I'm a trained trauma therapist and I am currently mm -hmm. the chief diversity and inclusion officer mm -hmm. here at Philadelphia Fight. Mm -hmm. Much of my career as a therapist has been working with members of our community who identify as LGBTQ. And I have seen and supported uh, people through the aftermath and traumatic effects that hate crimes cause to people who have endured them or to people who have had loved ones who have been hurt or killed by hate crimes. So I am grateful to Cheetah, the Cheetah organizers, Dr. Tashina Reeder and Kyle Shavasta for bringing the, the amazing panelists, Octavia Lewis, Dominique Morgan and Medusa Carter and I together for this important topic. And I am so glad that all of you are here to join us for this discussion. According to the FBI in 2019, hate crimes against LGBT community members was on the rise. At the time, one in five crimes were based on, uh, hate crimes were based on uh, anti-LGBT bias. Most of the women of transgender experience in Philadelphia that have been killed have been women of color. We know that most of the hate crimes endured by LGBT folks are not reported and happen more frequently than people realize. Children being kicked out of their homes for their gender or for their sexual orientation is a form of a hate crime. People being called names or physically threatened because of anti-LGBT bias are hate crimes. Physically assaulting someone or killing them because they are lesbian, gay, bisexual, or a person of the transgender experience is a hate crime. And such crimes are happening and need to be discussed and eradicated. Our panelists today will talk about this crisis and about their work to draw attention to the harms being done and what they are doing and what we can be doing to stop the violence perpetrated against members of our communities. I will ask each of the panelists to introduce themselves in just a minute, but I just wanna get us oriented to this present moment. We're talking about things that are potentially emotionally charged, this topic, it's painful. So I think it would be good to get oriented and to remind our bodies at this moment and our minds that we are not at this moment at physical risk. This practice comes from the work of racial trauma somatic experiencing practitioner and author, Resma Menicum. And so he suggests that we need to get into a practice of orienting our bodies to the present moment to be able to discharge some of the feeling of risk that many of us walk through and feel daily. So I, what I would like to do is invite you at this moment, before we have our span panelists speak, to just take a moment to feel your feet firmly on the ground if you're willing to. To feel the chair or seat, whatever is supporting you, to feel its support. And if you're willing to just take a few minutes to take some deep breaths, we'll do three of them together, breathing in slowly into your belly and slowing down your exhale even slower. So again, breathing in slowly and exhaling slowly. And one last time, I'd like you to breathe in slowly into your belly and exhale slowly. And I'd like you to take a minute to just turn and twist behind you and check to see what is there and what is not there. And if you can come forward and then I want you to look up and just pay attention to what you see, what you hear, what you're feeling on your skin. And then look to your right and I want you to bend at the hips to look down, stretching at your hips to see what's there, to see what you're feeling in your body. And then if you look to the left and do the same, twist or sit, stretch, looking down, stretching your body. and come back forward. It's so easy when we've experienced trauma or we have heard of trauma to, have, to be outside of our bodies. 
And it's important to be as present in the moment as possible so we can take in what's available and also take in any potential threats. But in this moment, hopefully we can come together and feel the strength of our panelists and to not necessarily feel any physical threat in this moment. So at this moment now, I want to thank you all again for joining us and to ask our panelists to introduce themselves. And I'll start with Octavia Lewis. Um, good afternoon, everyone. My name is Octavia Y. Lewis, MPA. I am an African-American woman of transgender experience. I am an activist, an advocate, humanitarian, mother, and scholar. Um, I currently reside in New York City, the borough of the Bronx, where I work for Montefiore Health Systems as the transgender coordinator. Thank you all for having me. Thank you, Octavia. Now I'd like to introduce Medusa Carter. Uh, peace and power. My name is Medusa Carter, I, artistically known as Black Rap Medusa. I'm a hip hop artist. Uh, my gender pronouns are they, them. I am a founder and CEO of Mary's Daughter for the, Fam uh, for the Formerly Incarcerated. Um, I work mostly with uh, uh, Black women, trans, uh, non gender folks who are formerly incarcerated and currently incarcerated, um, helping folks get their life back. Uh, thank y'all for having me. Thank you, Medusa. And now I'd like to introduce Dominique Morgan. Good morning, everyone. My name is Dominique Morgan. Good afternoon, depending on where you're at. My name is Dominique Morgan. I am the executive director of Black and Pink. Black and Pink is currently the largest prison abolitionist in organization in the United States, focusing on the intersections of the LGBTQ plus experience, um, folks who may identify as living with HIV and AIDS. Um, we are seeking every day to dismantle the systems of oppression that harm our people, prevent our people from having access to liberation while working with our people to help them um, dream um, and then bring their, their dream of liberation to, 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 to actuality. Um, I am a Black trans woman, um, formerly incarcerated myself, um, spent nearly a decade in the system as an adult and also navigated the system as a youth. Um, and so I'm really excited to be here today to talk about um, these topics and to share space with, space with these other amazing folks. Thank you for having me. Thank you so much, Dominic. So I am so excited. I, um, you know, have brought together some questions and I um, think I'd like to start uh, one with um, just kind of a general question. Um, you know, if people didn't realize before COVID um, and the mur murder of George Floyd, um, people are definitely becoming aware of systemic racism, anti-blackness, um, that it's pervasive and deadly, it's a pervasive and deadly issue in the US. Um, how do these issues uniquely impact LGBTQ plus members of our, our communities? And if each panelist would be willing to speak to that, I'd greatly appreciate it. Well, I can hop in there. <clears throat> At Black and Pink, we we really were, I don't think shaken is the right word, because what I've been saying since March is that COVID, <clears throat> COVID was a pandemic that exacerbated pandemics that were affecting the people that I serve already. So low key, it was like, okay, welcome to the party, y'all, but y'all got damn late. Um, um, the same way that COVID was out here killing folks and taking people out, Black trans women have been murdered the same way and, and people weren't giving a damn. I don't know how much we can cuss on here, um, so I'm gonna keep it kind of cute. Um, so the first thing we did was realize like their needs don't stop. As a matter of fact, the, 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 the ways that they were usually accessing funds um, and, and, and all those other things to get their needs changed. And then COVID happened, and then it was George Floyd. Um, and you realized just how tight in the intersections we sit. Just how far, just how far to the fringes that I feel like mainstream communities try to push us. But when these large 
issues impact our communities. In, in this sense, I'm meaning you had two big issues um, fall down on the Black community in secession. Then it was, well, everybody got to mount up. Everybody got to be on the front lines. And our inherent nature, and when I say our, as, as, as Black trans folks, GNC folks, our inherent nature is to show up for our people because if we don't show up for our people, no one else will. Um, and we've ha we have to be a forgiving people because if we held what community has done to us and has allowed that to prevent us from having community, our lived experience would be impacted more than it already is, right? But when, we were, when I was watching this in real time, I'm just like, yo, like, like my people are dying. Like in this time, Dominique Fells and, and Raya and all these folks were, were taken from us. And I'm trying, to, I'm trying to focus on George. I'm trying to focus on Brianna. But I, 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 I'm recognizing that no one, no one is ever going to give a fuck about us the way that we are caring about them. And that's scary um, to be in that space. Um, we talk so much about whiteness, which is so valid. But the amount of transphobia that that we have to navigate from black folks is frightening. The um, amount of the inability for some folks within the black spectrum to engage in culpability, even if they didn't kill the person, the way that they create spaces where our deaths are, 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 are ignited, right? COVID just, I feel like exacerbated that. Um, and, it, and, and it's been scary. Um, we, we dispersed about $30,000 in funds the first round directly to people. I just appro approved $20,000 more to go out to my community this week across the country. Um, and so I believe, unfortunately, right now, the best way for my folks to have some access to privilege is to keep money in their pockets. Um, and so that's, that's what I saw. That's what I'm trying to do to address it. Um, but it's definitely just a band-aid to a huge wound. I appreciate that, Dominique. And I'm going to um, definitely ask you to speak more to things that you're doing as well as things that you want other people to be doing um, as we go along. Um, I'm wondering if the other panelists want to speak to the unique ways in which um, the pervasive anti-Blackness and racism system uniquely impact um, LGBTQ uh, plus members of the community. Um, I'll go ahead and, and hop in. And also, thank you, Dominique, for that. Um, one of the things that happened is when you live at the intersection, uh, we we have to we have to. I don't I don't want to say forgive because I can't say that. I I know how to holistically forgive. But I will say that I know how to put my feelings to the side to get this liberation for my people. Because if none of if one of us ain't free, then none of us is free. And so it's trying to get that conversation, center that narrative, um, you know, with conversations with my family, with my friends, with my, you know, with 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 my loved ones. Um, uh, one of the things that I think uh, with COVID, I call it the gift and the curse because it allowed more people to. Um, start to recognize these intersectionalities that they live in. And I feel like when the uprising happened, that more people, um, I think, I see more solidarity um, in, in trying to build up these, uh, and trying to build up other movements because it was like, uh, it was like Black Lives Matter, Black Lives Matter with George Floyd, and not to, not to diminish it by far, but we didn't do that for uh, Tony McDade. We didn't do that for all the other folks, who, all the other trans folks, uh, non-gender conformant folks who, who were killed, who were murdered by the police, who were murdered by um, people that they trusted, who were murdered by just, who were murdered and no one went to look for them. Uh, one of the things that um, uh, Chapter of the Dink in Pittsburgh had a, an opportunity to do, um, and I say opportunity because it was, it was blessings upon blessings. Um, one of the one of my leaders in uh, Pittsburgh, her family member reached out to her um, saying that they, um, her daughter was missing. Um, a black trans woman, only 21, uh, was missing. And um, the last text she had from her was, um, was that you better not tell nobody. And that was from her, her boyfriend whom she moved out to San Francisco to be with. Um, but long and short, uh, we were able to, 
to uh, the, the family came to us and uh, we uh, we searched for the person in in Pittsburgh. We searched for Pittsburgh, um, but they had come up from Florida and had moved out to San Francisco. So we were searching for them there, but we didn't have a search party out in San Francisco. And so we were able to like send the family out there to go search for that loved one. And you know, they found her in a safe house. She was fearing for her life. They found her in a safe house. Like, I, like, like no, like, there's nothing I can say to, 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 to uh, speak to the way that God works, <laughs> the way that God works in our lives and the way that God shows up in our lives. So like, just, just seeing that and just witnessing that and being a part of that was like, um, was 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 like empowering but also it's like a telltale sign of all we have to do really is i think in my opinion is educate our community because that's one of the things that don't happen in the white communities they're talking to their children about non about gender non-conforming they're talking to their children about transgender they're talking to their they're having those conversations but we are not we are so busy trying to tuck all our our worth in trying to tuck all our you know, you don't want our slip showing or nothing, you know, we want to tuck all our stuff in because that's what we've been taught. That's what, that's what white supremacy has taught us to do was to tuck all of our, all of our greatness, all of our light to, 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 to tuck it in. And so I just saw that more people was like letting it out uh, in this go round and not saying that it's over and not saying that we, um, you know, that we don't have more conversations to have, but I see more uh, black people uh, show up in this era of COVID than I've seen in the last years of this fight. Thank you. Yeah, and I'll have also ask later, uh, Medusa, for you to speak more about what you feel like people can be doing. Um, so I'm wondering, Octavia, if you would, would be willing to speak to just the intersections that you see. I'm sure. Um, working on a large um, healthcare system here in New York, um, I did see a lot of like the refrigerated trucks and knowing like how real it was with seeing, you know, the ambulances parked at the zoo and like seeing ambulances from different states coming in to help with the influx of COVID cases. Um, so I saw that firsthand, um, hearing sirens 24-7, not being able to leave your home because you were scared to touch anything. Um, so for me, it was about staying in the house because I do have, you know, small children that I have to um, look after. Um, but for me, it, it was a lot of reactionary, um, methods from, um, black people. Um, and I can say it was reactionary for everyone because no one was prepared for it. Now, the way that people are showing up, would they continue to show up in this, in that fashion or manner? That's the thing that, that kind of gives me pause because for TG and C people, all we have ever known was showing up, like being on the front line and fighting and saying their names. And like, it, it just makes you think like, when are we ever going to get into a state where we're not always living in outrage or where we're not always living to say somebody's name? And I think that oftentimes we have been taught that that is the way that we have to live. And I don't think that that is a way in which anyone should have to live as always being in that fight or flight mode. So I do try to work on ways where I'm not always, you know, surrounded by that fight or flight. And what COVID has done for the community, for me, it has shown others where their vulnerability lies. Because we've always known where ours lie. We've always known that we did not have equitable nor equal access to health care, housing accommodation, education, you know, um, employment, um, medical care. We've always known those things. I think it began to make people look at it from the human perspective when it impacted everyone. So I think that is why people are showing up in, in the fashion that they are is because what we have been experiencing, what we have been living through, they now have to experience that. And for many people in our community, even though, you know, a, a, we have lost a lot of people or a couple of people to COVID in our community, it's like we knew what the dangers were. Like many of us moved in secrecy anyway. Many of us moved in, in a way in which we, were, we knew we were always vulnerable. 
but we had to move in ways in which to protect ourselves. And now the rest of the world has to now move in ways to protect themselves. So in essence, everything that we have been going through, in a sense, they now are faced with. And to see that, yes, our community can overcome many things, I think they are in the process of learning that they can as well. But I also think that their understanding of it is more broader now because they see that even though you can overcome it, this isn't something that people should have to always strive and always have to try to overcome. So that's what I think COVID has done for our community. Thank you. I'm wondering if we could ask our um, audience if they would be willing to put in the chat. I want you to take a minute and to think about when you think about the LGBTQ plus community, what comes to mind? What's one word that comes to mind, a phrase that comes to mind? And we're just going to take a minute then to, to look at them to see what comes up for you. I'm loving what I'm seeing, you know, um, when uh, Octavia and I spoke uh, yesterday, we thought that maybe some people's um, thoughts that maybe were not some of their negative thoughts that come in when they think about the LGBTQ plus community might come in. Um, but I'm, I'm loving seeing some of, of the pieces and I'm also feeling heartfelt for so many of the others in terms of the sense of mis being disrespected, mistreated, um, the sense of oppression, um, the sense of feeling afraid. But I, I hope people also know that in there are so many words of strength, uh, people thinking of community, of beauty, of people standing up and fighting, of um, having fun, of um, of strength, um, of resilience, but also, you know, what I think is useful is people really pointing out that it's complex and that there are times where it's fractured um, and um, where there are challenges. Um, and then other folks are, are saying things around just the fierceness and I think all, each of you in different ways, the panelists already have spoken to many of these ideas. We wanted this to be a space too though for learning. And so if there are people in the audience who are also thinking things that, they're, that often come to mind that are not positive, like we want this to be a space where people really start to examine and explore. Because one of the things that I think, Medusa, you're right on for suggesting is that we don't do enough, particularly among bi POC spaces, to educate our children around what it means to be transphobic and what it means to be homophobic. And so I want to ask our panelists now to define those terms. How do you see um, transphobia and homophobia showing up? And what are hate crimes? How do they show up in people's day to day? Because I think it's possible that there are people who are engaging in hate crimes or saying homophobic or transphobic things and may not even really realize it. So I'm wondering if the panelists, if you would be willing to speak to how do you define transphobia and homophobia and what are some examples of ways that it, that it shows up in the day-to-day -day engagements with people? I think uh, lack of inclusion is just the biggest uh, indicator of uh, a phobia. And I don't want to say a phobia like a fear, but a phobia like I don't want to be uncomfortable. And so we traditionally get left out of those spaces, especially like around leadership and around like development in our community, we get left out of those spaces. And so we have to create them. Um, I know for me, my, my reaction was to create my own organization and bring my own table because I wasn't invited to those uh, prison abolition spaces. I wasn't invited to those um, uh, women 
uh, women's rights and reproductive justice uh, uh, situation. I wasn't invited to those. I was, I was, uh, I, I had to put those together and make my own table. And so I think that, uh, that that's how you recognize who, even the most well-meaning of, of Black folks, the most well-meaning of comrades um, can exclude you. And that also goes back into that, like just the inability to want to be un uncomfortable. Thank you, Medusa. Um, I come from a public health background, spent years as an adolescent health educator, um, still do a ton of consulting around uh, equity and inclusion. And I'm, I'm starting to really lean into the, into the space where microaggressions are a cop out for people, like using that term. Um, I'm, I'm very comfortable discussing intent versus impact, but for you to grasp intent versus impact the way you need to, you really have to stand on when you mess up and how that sits. And I feel like we've created a culture where people, like looking at this question of what, what constitutes a hate crime, as an abolitionist, I, don't, I, I, am, I am challenging my epistemology to where I don't navigate the world um, using language like crime. Um, crime, uh, crime is inherently connected to incarceration, um, which to me is, is, is a hate crime, um, in, in my opinion. So I, if, we're, if we're being honest, I think we really need to just focus on harm. Um, and, 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 and that allows us to see the spectrum of harm. That harm can be, in the tense that we use in the work now today, a microaggression, and harm can be murder. And within that, there is opportunity to address the harm. Therefore, there's opportunity for transformation. Um, I also think that microaggression thing creates this hierarchy of what's forgivable and what's not forgivable. Um, and 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 Fam Medusa said it earlier about forgiveness. I think for me, first of all, I'm a Pisces, so I got beef with folks from kindergarten. Okay, so. Uh, to challenge just the way I am in general, it's really, it's really not so much um, forgiveness, it's grace. It's, it's, it's standing in and working in um, grace with this belief that as much grace as I have to give out, either I've received that or I'm going to need to receive it. Um, and I think that day-to-day -day piece, how does it show up? It can be everything from, I was doing a Facebook Live, I, so like I started, I had, transition in prison so i spent about 10 years in prison like she her fully presenting as film i get out of prison the entire world is essentially telling me in 2009 that as a black trans woman i'm not going to be able to thrive so i i i assimilate and socialize as male for 11 as, as male for 11 years and i started public facing transitioning again in january of this year right with presentation matt correlating with gender identity within the last week and a half. And yesterday I had a realization of how many times people told me to smile. How many times people were saying, th I'm walking through the grocery store, Facebook, anywhere, oh, you should smile. I'm like, where is where, where is this coming from? Or, or people critiquing like how I use filters and things of that nature. And I know this seems small, but I use this example to say that, but what it lands to me is, when I look angry, I don't look feminine enough for you. So that, so that, makes, me, that makes me question, um, is my womanhood valid? When I'm using a filter, it's saying that you think I look too good, you wanna see the flaws, which means that you don't want to accept how I'm presenting to you, like all of these things, and that's harm to me. And, that's, and again, that's small and it's a microaggression, but it's literally clouded my mind for two weeks. So, I would say we need to really start doing away with the hierarchy of, of harm and engage in conversations about harm in hopes that that inherently is tied to conversations of transformation. I want to uplift and I want to pin that it's very difficult to talk about harm and transformation when Black trans women are being murdered right in front of us. Um, and so we're trying to address historical harm, current harm, and, and, and do work to build the sort of community we want for our future. 
but there are those of us who sit in a space of privilege who are equipped to do that. I identify myself as one of those people. So I don't expect a, 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 a black trans girl who's, um, who's figuring out where she's gonna sleep tonight to have buckets and buckets of grace and do that sort of work. That's my responsibility, sitting in my, in my home with my cars in my driveway, with my job and my health insurance. I have access. What do you do with your access? Um, but quit giving people cop-outs of what a microaggression. If you are adults, do not think enough about what they say. And I think really talking about harm challenges people to, be, to use more forethought in how we engage with each other. Thank you, Dominique. I appreciate that. Octavia, did you want to speak to I just want to shout out to my former Pisces sister because I'm a Pisces as well. So I, I, I feel where you're coming from. Me too. Uh, <laughs> I'm a Pisces. <laughs> you got a whole Pisces panel? My God. I, I, I'm a Pisces. Um, but no, um, I, 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 I'm here for everything that has been said. I, I do think that people um, often get transphobia and transphobic they try to use them as if they're interchangeable. A person that is trans, that suffers from transphobia is actually a fear, which is a noun because it is describing that person. But when you are transphobic, you are actually doing something, which is an adjective, meaning that you are doing something to show what your displeasure or your dislike is. So when you're having conversations about trans women and a trans woman comes up, it's like, oh, you're gorgeous. I didn't know you was one of those. That is not a compliment. That is you actually being transphobic. When you see a trans woman and you look at her and you're like, oh, wow, you're actually beautiful, but you know, wow, you got big hands. That's not a compliment. That is you being transphobic because you are showing a prejudice against that person of trans experience. So I think we do have to be clear when we are having conversations with people because sometimes people will have on will have conversations not even knowing that what you're saying is not a compliment that you're actually showing up in transphobic ways and as dominique said i i am a firm believer in work equals payment and when you're asking people to perform a certain task or a, a duty then you need to pay people no one should have to show up to educate folks when you can get out there and you can type a keystroke and you can find out the things that you're wanting people to do for you for free. So, no, I don't believe in, in, in doing that to myself, and I don't believe in doing that to anyone else in my community. Again, when we talk about statistics and we talk about demographics, we have to, to realize, yes, and I heard Dominique, and, and, and I applaud her, you know, in her um, access or attainability of earned assets, because that's what I feel like we have. Privilege is not something that was bestowed upon us. We had to work. We had to strive. Sometimes we often had to be mistreated in order to get to this place of comfortability where some people had to do absolutely nothing and that they are in that same comfort level or they're in that same space. So for me, when I am having conversations, we also have to, you know, acknowledge even within our own circles, our own demographics, that sometimes there is that internalized transphobic behavior that happens where you will have some girls that will be like, oh, no, I'm not going to be with her because she's going to get me spooked and they're going to call me a mook and she's going to get me killed. They're going to get me clocked. I'm going to get knocked. I'm going to get bopped. And I'm not saying that any of that stuff is not valid. But I do think there are ways in which we can do that where it is not offensive. So for me, it is when I interact with young ladies that have that type of mentality. I also like let them know, like, you know that you are putting a sister in jeopardy, right? You know that when you are in a phase of transition that it is a forever evolving stage. You just don't get everything you want, and you're like, oh, I'm done. No, because there are certain things that you're still evolving with. So for me, even my own transition process, I would transition into the day that I leave here because I always want to be evolving. I always want to be learning. I always want to be in that space where I have something to give. And I think we have gotten to the point where we have gotten complacent with some people that are doing the work because 
they have been so far removed from the work that is being done that they are now actual figureheads. And when you become a figurehead and you have no close proximity to the people in which you are working to enact legislation, laws, anything of that nature to, to govern people, then you are taken on the ways of the oppressor. And I don't think that we like to oftentimes acknowledge that because I've had a conversation with colleagues yesterday and I said many of us have the mentality of an incarcerated person without confinement. Meaning that when we are in our spaces, when certain people come by, we like to say, ooh, girl, don't talk like that. Or you like to say, ooh, you better straighten up. We do that conformity and that performative narrative. That is the same way that those that are incarcerated behave. When they see that lieutenant come down the walk, they lock it up. They don't move. They don't say anything. They lock it up. We do the same thing. The only difference between us is we don't have those razor fences around us or electrical fences, but we have been conditioned to believe the same way. And I think that we really have to have those honest conversations on, like, how do we move away from those type of things? You know, and we do have to sometimes, and I'm not going to say call a person out, but I will say call them in to elevate them, to let them know, like, hey, this is an institutional harm that we're doing within, and we owe it to each other to do better. Sister Octavia, two things. I would like to offer up, instead of using the term pay us, compensate. Compensate hit on a little higher level. Yes, ma'am. You understand? You can, you, can, you, can, you can pay somebody with $5. You rarely hear a girl use compensate when it's just $5. 5000 is compensation. Compensate me and my people. And, and the other thing that, that really started from what you were saying, um, the, 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 the internal... Um, battles we have within the Black trans community that we see, I, 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 it frustrates me when we, when we turn towards each other and it's not in the spirit of calling each other in, it's in a spirit of calling each other out or othering each other because of our, 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 where we are in our transition instead of um, calling out, uh, uh, putting the light on the systems of oppression that makes us feel like whatever um, way our womanhood presents, or or whatever our the what however we present is 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 it not enough because I feel like enough is um, I guess so first when people say like I'm compliant that's like bare minimum I'm saying let's focus on these systems and these false narratives and all of these um, all of these boxes that have been perpetuated for us that make us think that the only way for me to be the best is for you to be less than I am um, and that's and 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 that's that's where our time can be put. So we have to do that yes and of reprogramming that internal thing that, that, that happens in marginalized communities. Black folks do it, um, Latinx folks do it, like it happens. Right. How do we pivot from that and then use that energy to address the sense systems who have been perpetuating that harm, you know, since the beginning of our people's time? And I'm wondering with that, thank you, Dominique, and thank you, Octavia and Medusa for your response. So the last question, I'm thinking about the systems of harm and I'm wondering if there are ways in which um, you each might wanna speak to some of the ways in which you think social services, educational and housing agencies, legal and healthcare systems have perpetuated harm um, in terms of racism, the intersection of racism, anti-blackness, homophobia and transphobia. Um, let's, let's just start out and say that uh, America, especially white America with uh, the pharmaceutical companies and, 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 and Medicare, medication, all of that, let's just say that they've been experimenting on us since slavery. So, so all of that. So you add that into all of our experiences up to this day. Uh, the Henrietta Lapses, the, all of the, so they've been experimenting on our bodies. They've been dehumanizing our bodies for centuries. So this, this is nothing new, but I think also with like, um, just healthcare in general, especially for poor people, poor black people, we don't get access anywhere. And so on top of um, someone who's transitioning or someone who needs extra care, um, uh, like extra healthcare, someone who actually needs access, there, there is real, really no access, especially if you're formerly incarcerated, there's not very many options for you. You talk about Medicare, you talk about the, the, the uh, governmental services, there's not many uh, services offered to you in the first place. 
um, let alone have this intersectional identity. So on top of that, there's, there's just less assets in the first place. Um, that's all I got. Thank you, Matissa. Octavia or Dominique, do you want to speak to some of the more systemic ways in which these intersections of, of harm show up? Go ahead, Octavia. Go ahead, sis. No, 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 because I, I just lost my train of thought. So you can go ahead, Dominic, because I was going to say something, then it just slipped my mind. I, I will specifically talk at the space of healthcare, um, especially for, for, and at Black and Pink, we use the term system impacted because just as we were talking about within marginalized communities, like people will turn in on each other. Specifically around the no, uh, the no New Jails campaign in New York, I was watching formerly incarcerated people create a hierarchy of what it meant to be formerly incarcerated. Well, if I only went to jail, then I really didn't have anything to say. If I only went to state time, and it, 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 it began to build privileges inside of this terrible, terrible experience and harm we've had, which is incarceration. I, we use system impacted because it allows us to create a larger center. If I can talk about the person who was in the institution, I can be referring to their child, I can be referring to their sibling, I can be referring to the neighborhood they grew up in. All have been impacted um, because the carceral state has decided to descend upon them. Um, so I just wanted to give that that kind of that that kind of space to to, to give you all a understanding of what I'm saying. Navigating healthcare inside of institutions is never and will never be based in your power. And so this idea of filling out a kite, um, literally the experience of healthcare inside of prisons is, are you dying? Are you dying? Oh, you're not dying? Here's an ice pack. And we're gonna put some simple green in the ice pack so you don't use the ice for your Kool-Aid later because it's really that damn deep. Um, oh, 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 your arm hurts? Do you have money on your canteen to buy Tylenol? Oh, you have allergies? Well, this is really what you need, but we don't have that on the dispensary. So this is what you want to have to make it with. And yes, your allergies may be so bad you can't open your eyes, but you still got a 12-hour shift in the kitchen. Oh, you don't want to go to the kitchen? Mutinous actions, let's put you in the hole. That's the only way you're going to rest and sleep when you're sick on the inside, or, you, or they're going to will you out of there and, and be dead. So you juxtapose that against the expectations that healthcare systems have in the community. I, I was privileged to work at Charles Duhill Health Center in Omaha, Nebraska, um, and work under the Adolescent Health Project, and be able to work in a system where I could see all facets of how healthcare was working, and the expectation that they want you to go in and dictate your healthcare experience. How does a person who has never experienced or wielded that power of speaking to a healthcare professional come into go from prison and walk into Charles Jewett, walk into any federally qualified health center or ER in the country and be able to say, listen, I know exactly what I can ask you for. I know I can ask you to look at my chart. I know this, that, and the third. No, this is what you're offering me, but this is what I really need. How does that happen when you've never wielded that power? There's people who sit in a, 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 an immense space of privilege and access who can't have those conversations with their physician, right? And so, one of the most egregious things the system does is falsely perpetuate this idea that they prepare you to be a successful, well-adjusted adult, when in actuality, they, they seek to dismantle um, you having any sort of attachment and understanding of your power and, and, and your autonomy. And then they throw you back in the street and expect you to be able to walk around and know how to navigate this world. And then when you stumble, if you fall, then it is your fault. Um, so when I look at healthcare, we really have to do a better job of not only meeting people where they're at, we need to do a better job of individualizing the experience of healthcare. And I know that, I know that inflates budgets. I know that means that you have to add to your team. Um, and, and, and when I say we, I'm talking about the institutions, I'm talking about funders, so many of these initiatives, right, are, are, are public plus private funding. I'm talking about people who are leading and creating these policies. I'm talking about these doctors who have may, may have been doing something for the same way for 20 years. Baby, it may have to change in 2020. Um, and really lay out to people what they can have and be a part of, be a part of helping them craft their healthcare experience. 
You know, there was nothing more incredible than someone meeting me at Charles Drew and me giving them the list of all the things that they can have and all the ways that they can wield it. And knowing that they may not come back to Charles Drew for their next appointment, but they have that in their pocket. Um, let's do a better job of investing in patients, even if they're not your lifelong patient. Let's do a better job of, 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 of not holding staff to numbers or because a lot of that, a lot of the ways that we choose not to individualize healthcare is based on the fact that, oh, you need to see 10 people in the hour. And if you're not seeing this number of people in the hour or this number of people in the day in the agency, then you're not going to keep your grant or you're not really, you're not really hitting fiduciary, I mean, of fidelity of, of whatever you're doing. Let's recognize that putting people first means that we have to be innovative, means we have to think outside the box, means that we have to do a lot of work to envision what we want our community to look like, but understand that that hard work is going to pay off because we may realize in our lifetime, lifetime a place where everybody has an equitable access, has equitable, equitable access to thriving in our communities. I appreciate what you're saying, Dominique, because one of the things we know is that if you want to change a system, you need to change the system from the people who have been most harmed and everything that you're speaking about that you feel like um, patients of the LGBTQ plus experience need are what we all need. Um, and so, you know, what you're speaking to is the needs of, of everybody. Octavia, did you want to speak to this, this question? I, I have a question that somebody has put in a, the Q&A that I want to ask, but I, I also want you to have a chance to speak to this if you'd like. Hi, Octavia. I'm sorry. I was. Uh, I definitely. I think that we also have to realize the principles in which our foundation lies, or our society lies. I do believe that all of these systems, you know, intersect at one point in another, but I also believe in the mentality that a lot of these systems poverty to pimp our people. And when people don't realize that there is a lot of money in keeping people in poverty. And I realized that when Notre Dame caught fire and, and Notre Dame raised almost a billion dollars in less than a week, but yet they tell us that it's too expensive for us to implement this model of care or we can't do this because it's going to break our budget. They teach, they keep us in this scarcity model because they tell us it's not enough. But if you can come up with almost a billion dollars in a week for a institution that people know has caused bodily harm to others, that is a problem. And for us to continue that cycle of saying, well, oh, we don't have enough. There's not enough for us to, you know, create this new program. You're right. There's not enough buy-in because people say that we're not going to benefit or we're not going to make money off of it. And as Dominique, you know, pointed out when we talk about grants, when people often bring grants into organizations, if you look at the overhead that is taken out of those grants versus what you're getting paid for your salaries and your fringe benefits, those that are not even touching the grant are getting the cutoff of it, just as an administrator. And they are on several different grants, and they're ending up making way more than you are, but yet you're struggling trying to make ends meet with a full-time job working off of this grant, trying to get people in, trying to make sure that these people have the individualized care that they deserve. And like Dominique said, they want to tell you that if you're not seeing this amount of people in one day, then you're not being productive, which is not true at all. Because what they end up doing with those numbers of people that came in for one thing, they end up utilizing them on another thing. And therefore, they done got money on another grant, and them people not even touching that. But yet, you done inflated it, conflated it, and you done got paid hand over fist. And yet, we're the ones, especially those lower line, front line workers that are doing the work. And when we tell you that, hey, this is not really benefiting our people, 
Like, you know there are other ways in which we can do this way to be more conducive, and it'll be less harmful to our community. They don't want to hear those things. So I'm, when I'm asked to be a part of anything, I always ask them, now, what is my community going to get from this? How are they going to benefit? And particularly when it comes down to doing research in our community, I always ensure that if you want me to bring someone in from my community for you to sit and interview, have conversations with, take their intellectual property, you are going to list them as a subject matter expert in this document because they deserve the credit. Because without them, you wouldn't have this knowledge and you would not be getting these awards and these accolades for all of this wonderful documentation that you have provided. But yet, my people don't have any transferable skills, but you came in and got this. No, we're going to help them in this research process because we're going to teach them transferable skills. They're going to know what sending a face mail is. They're going to know how what it is to answer the phone. They're going to know what it is to take quantitative data. They're going to know what it is to take qualitative data. And we're going to help them write that up into a resume where they can get a job that is not going to pay them a minimum wage, but a living wage. And I think that's how we have to utilize and leverage our earned assets that we have to ensure that others in our community are going to be coming up with us. Because I have a firm belief that I don't like to be the only person of trans experience in anybody's room. Because I don't represent the whole trans community as a whole. And I feel like we do a disservice when we feel like we have done something when we're the only person in the room. I feel like we've actually made ourselves a target. Because now all these people know, okay, so we got this one in the room. If anything goes wrong, we know where they, we know who the you know scapegoat. We know who the railroad. And, and I just don't believe in being anywhere by myself when I know that I work with a whole community that is knowledgeable and as resourceful as the TGNC community that I have the privilege of being a part of. Thank you, Octavia. I feel like you guys have each like started to talk about what are things that we could be doing. One of the audience members had had a question. I wanted to, you know, first talk about what is the problem and then talk about what are some of the solutions. One of the audience members um, specifically uh, was curious about the fact that um, we started out with talking about that there, one of the things we needed to be doing was also educating within the by POC um, community around homophobia and transphobia. And one of the Audience members asked, is there some sense that within bi POC communities that there's more homophobia or transphobia than the uh, larger community? And, um, and I wondered if you all would speak to that or in the white community. Um, is that accurate really to think that bi POC people are more um, transphobic or homophobic? I just want to like I'm having like a knee jerk reaction to that comment. Um, first and foremost, I think that to place any uh, hatred or um, a phobia on the black community after post traumatic slave disorder after we are just coming up out of slavery and to say, oh, it's, it's more so in this. No, we learned hatred from you. We learned oppression from you. We learned uh, all this stuff that we're enacting now was learned behavior. We have been conditioned by your system of hate. And so that is what's enacting. So there's no way possible. Don't get me wrong. The closest get the most. So in our community, we may target our hate and our, um, our animosity towards one another. But that's because we're, and that's the same for uh, the Latinx community. It's the same for the Asian community. It's the same for any community who's, uh, the, we, we go, the first people, these are the people that I'm around. It's my community. So of course, I'm going to attack them first. But make no mistake about it. We learned this hatred. We learned this internalized hatred from our oppressors. We learned it from our former slave masters, and that's what's happening. So there, I, in my opinion, and I'm just going to speak from my own experience, that I don't think it's possible for us to hate ourselves, uh, for it to be more hateful than... I than, think that was the panelist's point, that they wanted to clarify that they felt okay. it was fair to think that, that it was stronger in the BIPOC communities than elsewhere. Right. So I appreciate okay. you clarifying that, Medusa. Okay, I just okay, had a reaction. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Sorry for, for getting your uh, getting your charge up. Um, 
I and, I, and, you I, and I agree that? with Ms. Dusa. I, I think the problem is is that the way the media has perpetrated if if it only happens in our community, would give people this complete idea of like, oh, it only happens there. And I think if we look at a lot of these nonprofit organizations that are supposed to be helping black and POC people, if you look at who resides as their CEOs, their board of directors, and their upper management, majority of the time they don't look like us. But yet a lot of the same thing that they're saying that we do, they are orchestrating it on a, on a larger scale. So with us, yeah, you will see it because it's one-on-one. -on -one. You see someone get jumped. You see someone get beat. So you think, oh, that, that, that community, this is what they do. But you're not talking about how you or, or, or whiteness can sit behind the desk and swipe a pen and it can impact the whole community. So, yes, when ours may be, you know, more individualized, I think what whiteness does is more systematic, and it has a far wide-reaching um, effect on our community than what we do within our community. Thank you. I want to take a minute before we shift into solutions um, and what you would ask of white people who are, let's say, cisgender or uh, white systems or white dominated systems, what you would ask in ter terms of challenging the transphobia and homophobia and, and the intersection of racism and anti-blackness. Before we move to that, I'd like to just take a minute for our audience as well as our panelists to just um, really feel into what's coming up for you. Just as like Medusa, you had said, you felt that sense of charge in the way that I worded the last question, what are people sitting with in this moment? And if you want to put in the chat some of your feelings that are coming up for you and what you're sitting with, um, please feel free to share. Um, and also do what you need to do to take care of yourself. I really, if you're sitting in tension, if you find that your shoulders are, are, are tight and your arms are tight or your fists are starting to clench, start to take some deep breaths again look behind you to see that there's not a predator behind you take you know check and bend at your hips take some deep breaths remind yourself that in this moment you are not at physical risk it's not healthy or useful to our bodies to stay in a state of alertness and high alertness and sense of risk it is the releasing then of chemicals that then tend to break down our nervous systems and our organs and so the more you can realize when you are in a heightened state of risk a heightened state of of alertness that when you're not actually physically at risk the more you can calm yourself down the better and this is a daily practice and so i really want to help you at this moment or remind you at this moment to please pay attention to what you're feeling in your body take some deep breaths and, and really uh, calm the nervous system as we're talking about these things that are heavily charged and painful. So I don't know if you, if I just wanna see if people have, have shared things. People are really appreciating what the panelists are saying. Um, they're, it's resonating with people. People are feeling both love and anger and rage, tension and anxiety. Um, People are appreciating that we're talking about this um, and, and really appreciating when people are, that the panelists are also speaking to the internalized pieces. I think often in panels, we often act like we're just talking to white, uh, white audiences, but we have POC LGBT people in the audience. And I really appreciate that we're talking also about the internalized pain and the pieces that we learned from our oppression. Um, and the ways in which we sometimes perpetuate that on ourselves and others. So thank you panelists for, for speaking to both experiences. Some of the questions that are coming up uh, for, for um, people in the audience and, um, and also were questions of mine were about what are some of the things that um, agencies, healthcare agencies, housing agencies, educational systems, 
social um, services, legal systems can be doing in order to disrupt the racism, the anti-blackness and homophobia to become more inclusive. Um, and so particularly people were interested in how are people going to feel trusting of healthcare systems and also what are people, what can healthcare systems as well as other social services do um, in order to create environments that feel inclusive. So if the panelists want to speak to that, I know it's a tall order, um, but you guys have been giving uh, pointers along the way. If you want to kind of sum them up, that would be great. Thank you. Um, Dr. Jones, can I answer the question that you had posed about um, what can, what is it, that why allies can do? Wasn't that one of the questions? Yeah, I um, kind of, I had lumped it into what are things that people can do. So please, if we want to start on the individual level, go, let's go ahead. I don't think it's, and I'll just keep it on the eye and I'll just keep it personal. I don't think it's fair to come to someone and say, well, what can I do? versus you already know what your capabilities are and you already know what you're willing to relinquish. I think it's fair for white people to come to the table and say, heck, this is what I'm willing to give up. This is what I'm willing to do. This is where I'm willing to like assist you in going. Because when you come with that and then our community members really sit down and they do the work and they delve down and they come up with expectations for you to live up to, and you come back and say, well, oh, I can only do one of the things off of your list of 10 things. Now you have just caused our community all of this to relive this trauma and this harm without saying that, you know what, I only had the intentions of showing up to say this is what I wanted to do. And I think they need to start being clear with that, that this is what I'm hearing, this is what I'm willing to give up, this is what I'm willing to do. Because when you have people put in that work, that emotional labor, that physical labor of like coming up with these solutions and you really don't have no way of helping people with those solutions, then that's a disservice to our community. So I'm just going to challenge them that please stop asking, what can you do? And if you really want to show up, say this is what I'm willing to offer and this is what I'm willing to give up, leverage, or help you all with attaining. Thank you, Octavia. I really appreciate your uh, point of view on that. Do other um, panelists, Dominique or Medusa, have thoughts particularly about what, what can a cisgender white uh, person do to be an advocate for inclusivity? Um, I honestly, uh, I don't think that liberation is a multiracial movement. I think that liberation is something that our community needs to come to itself about. I think that it's conversations that we need to have within our own community and no white person can come and help us with that. Uh, no other race of people can help us with liberation. Now you're talking about social justice, that's different because we're talking about society. But you're talking about liberation for black people, what you can do to help is go talk to other white folks. That's what you can do, you can go get your folks. And we can go get our folks we can come to, uh, we can bring political education to our community. We can educate our community on what's actually happening or what that state, what that risk and what freedom actually looks like. We haven't had a moment to think about freedom or liberation. And so we don't need no well-meaning white folks to come in and try to help us understand what freedom and liberation is according to them. So, you know, all you well-meaning white folks appreciate you. Thank you. But go talk to your folks because that's the reason that we're dealing with systemic racism and systemic uh, oppression and um, anti-blackness and anti-trans and anti-GNC and anti just anti everything, right? <laughs> so yeah, that's what I got. Can you say more about then coming together for social justice, and then I'll have Dominique, please. I think that again, social justice, uh, even the, 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 the word implies social. So we're talking about society. So societal ills is something that a multi-racial group can come together and say, hey, this is how I'm experiencing this. And hey, this group is experiencing this this way. And this group is experiencing this way. And that's fine when you're talking about, you know, the melting pot of America. But when you're talking about the former slaves of America, we have not had an opportunity to think about freedom or liberation. We have been on the run. We have been in survival mode. We have been in constant, constant, constant trauma, compacted issues of trauma on top of trauma, on top of trauma, on top of, we don't even know where the trauma is coming from anymore. It's just, it's just deep seated. Uh, it's generational, it's passed on. So 
again, no well-meaning white person with, I don't care how much money you have, and I don't care how much, I don't care how much good intentions you have. Our liberation is, is based on ourselves and it's, it's within our community that we will discover that. Thank you. Dominique? I think um, Octavia Medusa really laid it out. I think what I would add to that is really take some time and do some internal investigation to figure out how you can weaponize your privilege and how you can make sure that folks, you don't have to have your hand in the work to support the work. You don't have to be in the room to um, make sure that the, to, to do something to support the room's existence. Um, low key, a lot of y'all need to write a check. No shade. Um, a lot of these, a, a lot of uh, the work to decenter yourself and to be comfortable without yourself being essential to the process is something that, 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 that white people have to do. And they struggle with it. We want you to have, we want you to have ERGs, we want you to do all these things, but we, we want to come sit in the meeting. We want to, um, we want to have, you know, these spaces where we bring, bring women together and black trans women together and all these things, but we, we, we'd love to sit in and take notes. Um, we, we, like all these other things, it's how do you support and then get out of the way? And, 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 and minimally, I tell folks all the time, if you, want to, if you want to do the work of serving a population, ask them what they need and then be very comfortable and ready to provide said need and understand that that need may not align with what you think their need is um, and be comfortable with it. Um, there are EDs who have been in positions over these organizations for 20 some years. As a person who's been executive director for three years, I can say that after five or 10 years, if you haven't done what you came to do, then I don't know what makes you qualified to be in the job. There are people who are sitting in management, middle management positions that create these kind of fodder positions that they love to put, you know, we're gonna put this black trans girl in outreach. Girl, go out there and get your people. What have you done to really create avenues for folks to have access to their, to their vision of their best, best self? You understand what I'm saying? And oftentimes when, when, when the most marginalized are looking at the road to their liberation, it's riddled with barriers and it's riddled with the most privilege standing in our way. So, so, and all of those things can be done and all of that work can, um, can be activated without black folks, black trans folks, the most oppressed, like doing it hand in hand with you. Y'all can go in a room and y'all can get into that on your own, which I think is more powerful. Come up with these solutions. You've caused the harm, engage in the work to figure out how you can address the harm. Um, because that's really where that transformational experience happens, in my opinion. Thank you. Thank you all. Um, I'm wondering um, what have been, um, I want to ask, one, I want to ask the audience if they want to start putting in some questions in the Q&A. Um, I'll ask one more question of our, our panelists and then I'll, I'll try to answer, have them answer some of the questions from the, the audience. Um, you know, I think, so I, I had a bunch of questions, but I, I'm trying to think of what might be most useful so that people can walk away uh, with what you want them to, to have uh, on their plate. So maybe I should actually just ask that rather than asking all my detailed questions. What, what, is, what is it that you want uh, the audience members when they came to this to talk about the crisis of hate crimes against um, Black uh, LGBTQ uh, plus uh, community members, what did you want people to walk away with? What is it that you feel like you, the do one thing that they can do to really, um, start to disrupt in themselves or to disrupt in their lives uh, the systemic oppression that, and the, even the individual interpersonal oppression that they perpetuate or uphold or experience. So I just jammed a lot into one little question and I apologize, just do the best you can with it. <laughs> Thank you. Um, I would 
definitely leave people with the motto, which my mentor taught me, that people do not care how much you know until they know how much you care. I think that the system has placed so much importance on having all of those letters behind your name that sometimes we forget to look at the people in front of those letters. And sometimes a lot of those people that have all of those letters behind their names do not always have the best intention for you with their death. And I think that, again, I would never be one that tell people not to get or receive formalized education, but I also tell people that there is a thin line between, you know, being that elitist and being that person that is really there for the community in which you serve. So I, I definitely hold that mirror up to my face and, 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 and really have to ask myself that over and over and tell myself that people really do not care how much you know until they know how much you care. So I, I don't allow that earned access that I have to make me lose sight of that girl that once had to do survival sex work, that girl that was once homeless. Like I never allow those letters to make me forget what it was like to not to have anything. So I would definitely leave that, you know, with people is that if you have not came from any of those struggles, surround yourself with people that have so that you can have an understanding. You may not really be able to empathize or put yourself in that in, in that person's shoes. And I'll be honest, I wouldn't want anybody to put themselves in my shoes of being homeless or having to do survival sex work when you live in the supposedly the greatest country in the world. So no, I would not wish that upon my enemy. But I I do wish that people would really start to again invest in those communities because sustainability will come from within. We have the tools to sustain ourselves, but we just need sometimes for you all to leverage that playing field and sometimes to get out of the way. Thank you. Medusa, did you want to? Oh, no, sorry. Or Dominique? I, I mean, I think specifically looking at this space of mass incarceration, um, there are there there are some things happening that that I think the average person who peripherally, especially health educators, folks who are in the health space, I I, I wholeheartedly see comprehensive sex education as a tool to dismantle mass incarceration. I I, I wholeheartedly believe that. Um, equitable experience around health, prepare folks who have been system impacted to thrive in communities. Like it's essential, past pills, past getting them on a, a medication regimen. I'm talking about the experience of having an ecosystem of health around you um, positions you really to, 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 to stabilize. And again, be on this trajectory of thriving, which I believe is the ultimate goal for our people. Um, but to not be really tricked and hoodwinked by some of the prog some of the progressive things that you're seeing around the, the the injustice system, the First Step Act. I've never seen anybody who who identifies as queer, anybody who presents as as anything but cis, straight, Christian, um, and 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 for the most part male, um, be liberated through the First Step Act. Um, when we're looking at these reductions in these drug sentences, it's not queer, black, and trans folks who are who are who are who are being liberated with these changes when we're looking at the the law changes around youth who are being um, um, charged as adults we're not seeing queer youth impacted that way and and so we're seeing movement happen but our people are still being left out so as health as health professionals as people who work within these systems how are you going to use your access and your privilege and your reach to challenge these, these these harmful systems, and in this case, jails, prisons, this this kind of this this kind of dark dang plank where, where that harm happens, to see us. What type of work are you doing to equip yourself with? If you're if 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 you're the doctor that goes into the prison, that you know how to navigate to where this girl getting her hormones, you know how to make that happen. 
or you're working in the emergency room and somebody comes out of the prison and they shackle and handcuff somebody while they're in surgery, do you have the language and the protocols and understand what, what you can pull out to have them move that? Equip and, 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 and weaponize yourself to be an ally to the most oppressed and you're gonna be an ally to everyone. Um, and, and, and that's so important in times like these where we don't know what post COVID even looks like for us. But what I can say is that although COVID is causing immense harm, COVID is just a new iteration of the waves of harm that have affected our people for generations. And we've come back to the answer repeatedly is see us, affirm us, lift us up. And when we need you to have our back, be ready to do that and be equipped to do it. Do not bring a, a, a water pistol to a gunfight. Um, get, your, get your pistol ready. Thank you, Dominique. Um, my, my thing is when we heal together, we can build together. The biggest thing that I think impacting us right now is, is trauma. Trauma, address your trauma. Let's start to heal. I think the biggest thing that, that if I could leave anybody with, with anything is to work on your hearing and, and, and your healing. And interrogate those systems of oppression and conditioning that you've inherited from your mama and your mama's mama and your mama's mama, mama's mama. You know what I'm saying? Those that the healing, the trauma in our community is 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 has been compounded for centuries, and we will not begin to heal ourselves until we start to interrogate those systems that we're digesting. We digested a lot about ourselves. We digested a lot about our people. We digested a lot about uh, America in general or the world altogether. And I think that the, the healing piece, the trauma piece, is what a lot of people don't talk about, especially like um, us who have been impacted by ca incarceration. Um, and, go, and, and again, you could look at the school to prison pipeline, how they are more willing to uh, militarize the schools than add school counselors. When our children are dealing with, um, you talk about Chicago, I'm here in Philly, where there's shootings every day, where they're, they're shooting children, they're shooting, and there's no system in place to help these people deal with this trauma. It's, it's, it's traumatic to witness a shooting. It's traumatic to know what to do when you witness a shooting. It's, it's traumatic for the police and the ambulance to constantly be in your community, to be over police like that. That's traumatizing. It's, tra it's traumatizing for rape culture to exist still now in 2020. It's traumatizing to lose loved ones. It's traumatized to, it's all of that. Even looking at fake news is traumatizing because you don't know what to believe. You, you misinformed or you uninformed. You don't know what to do. And so I think right now is to, you know, let's interrogate those systems that we have bought about ourselves and about the world around us. Um, we heal together, we build together. Thank you. Dominique, did you want to say something else? I am so grateful to all of you. And I, I feel like we're talking about things that are so um, present, um, as you've said, like these are not new harms. Um, and they are things where we each individually and in our communities have to be healing ourselves so that it can actually then lead to liberation and then lead to justice. Um, and so I feel like you guys have called um, people to action, both around what they can be doing individually, what they can be doing as advocates um, and supports to other communities, um, but also what they need to be doing first to, to really look at themselves. And so I really appreciate that. And, um, and I appreciate the gifts and the knowledge and the skills that you have all brought. Um, I'm grateful to each one of you for all that you've shared. Um, I, you know, uh, what I'm seeing in the chat from people are um, just how much they have valued what you have shared um, and uh, how generous they feel like you've been in terms of your sharing. Um, and uh, really appreciate the ways in which you all have shown up and um and i really um appreciate that and and am grateful and i'm grateful on behalf of myself as well as uh all of the people in the audience um, is there anything last words that you would like to say uh yeah on sunday august 9th we're doing a an impacted gender oppressed day impacted black gender oppressed day i be god 
Um, and the idea is to, we've seen a lot, it's Black August. So if folks are not uh, familiar with Black August, um, it's, uh, it's impacted people's month. Uh, so what I've not seen in any of these uh, uh, uprisings or, or, or uh, Black Lives Matters was impacted Black and gender oppressed. So that, that's, a whole, that's a whole bunch of intersectionalities um, and a whole bunch of differences. And on Sunday, we will be raising that up. We have, uh, we have actions happening in Atlanta. We have actions happening in Pittsburgh and here in Philadelphia. So if mm -hmm. you're not able to make it out uh, on Sunday at 3.30, Malcolm X Park. Uh, and it's uh, Sunday, 3.30 at um, House of Mena in Pittsburgh. If you're out there in Pittsburgh and if you're in Atlanta, Folks will be gathering um, in West uh, West Atlanta. I'm not sure the address at this time, but um, it is a day. Tweet something out, IG, put a picture up, something like that. If you know an impacted person, tag them in the post. Uh, you can follow us on IG, Dignity Act Collective underscore, um, and and check out what's what's going on. Uh, we've been bailing out uh, Black mothers, caregivers, trans, uh, non-gender folks. And they, we've been trying to provide as much resources as possible, but it's just not enough. Folks need housing, folks need employment, folks need substance abuse care, folks need mental health care. We need all of that. So we want to raise awareness around that day, but we also want to raise awareness in general, uh, specifically for impacted um, TG and GNC folks. It's a lot more harder for us to get our lives back than any other group who comes home. Is there some Man information that you want to put in the chat for folks, Medusa? That they okay. can just like um, a website or, or uh, FaceTime or something, or if not Face at Facebook. Uh, you yep. read off a, a address. I'm thinking maybe you might want to put it in the chat. <laughs> Dominique, did you have anything else that you wanted to share, Octavia? I was going to say to Medusa, um, shoot me an email so we can get some bail funds out to you all and see how um, I can connect you to my director of programs and see how we can support that. Um, I, I, I just want to say, like, like your support at this time is huge for folks who are doing, whether it's grassroots or people who are, in structure, who are in that structure of the nonprofit industrial complex, if you are a Black leader, if you're a Black queer leader, specifically a Black trans leader of these agencies, um, it's, it's, we're, we're figuring out how we maintain our work and, and then how do we do our work at a higher level at a time when people are trying to reduce our access or reduce our funds. So that community support is essential. Um, so I, I, I know that seems so redundant or it feels like you're at the, you know, you're at the nonprofit dinner and you've got the little envelope under your dinner plate. But, but honestly, um, that's what we need right now. We, we need resources um, to be able to um, keep our staff paid, to be able to meet our folks where they need us. And, 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 and the less restricted they are, the better because People want it. People will give you grants for but for bail, but not realize that if, if you were homeless and you got locked up because you were still in a sandwich, and I bond you out and I don't have money to house you, well, baby, I'm just another person, a part of the harmful cycle that was going on before I got there. So, so, so those wraparound services that work um, doesn't always look the way we think it's supposed to look, but it matters, and it and it, and it hits the way it's supposed to hit when the folks who are supposed to be in charge of it are in charge of it. So do your due diligence. Um, to support those efforts. You have three folks in front of you. Um, you have House of Tulip led by Brian Moore. You have the Transgender District led by um, Arya Saeed. Um, um, like there's so many amazing Black trans folks who are leading work um, that you can support um, at times like these. So I challenge you to do so. Thank you so much. Um, I know Kyle wanted to jump back on and just um, talk about ways of sharing resources, but Octavia, did you have anything else that you wanted to say very quickly? Um, no, I just wanted to say, you know, again, I have learned a lot. And this has been one of the most intentional conversations that I've had in a long time. And Dominique and Medusa, like, Thank you for dropping the, that knowledge. Like those gems are, are definitely something that is going to replenish my spirit, you know, keep me grounded, keep me focused in the work. Um, so again, I, I, I thank you both for what you have taught me because I'm definitely walking away from here um, better than I came. So I definitely thank you both for that. And, and thank you, Dominic. Thank you. I feel the same about all of you as well. 
Kyle, did you want to jump on? Thank you. Yes, I just wanted to say thank you to all the presenters and Dr. Jones for moderating. This was a tremendous panel and I wanted to thank the audience for uh, staying with us and being really intentional with your questions and your feedback and uh, feeling uh, brave enough to share your feelings. Um, so thank you everyone. And also I just wanted to give everyone a little logistic note. Um, my program, the Community Health Training Alliance will happily act as a connector of resources. So to Octavia, Dominique and Medusa, if you have any resources or ways in which people can compensate or donate, uh, let us know and we will get that to our audience members in a follow-up. And to the audience, um, there is a brief survey after this. Um, so just stick around and uh, let us know how this was and how we are doing. So thank you everyone. I want you all to have a good weekend. Be kind to yourselves and uh, take care. <laughs> Yes, thank you all so much. Thank you to the audience for your participation. And I just want to ask you that if you feel yourself still really tense or activated, take some deep breaths, shake yourself out, move around, and really pay attention to what's coming up for you. Um, because this is hard work and we all need to be around to keep doing it. So please take care of yourselves. Thank you. Thank you so much, Octavia. Thank you so much, Dominique. And thank you so much, Medusa. Thank you, Kyle. I am so grateful to all of you and I'm just feeling really honored that I got to be with you. So thank you.